Hello and welcome to the GFRP latest developments webinar. My name is Paula Hyman from the Ohio LTAP Center and I'm going to be your technical support for today's webinar. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you have questions throughout this presentation, please type them into the questions box and our presenters will address your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, go ahead and locate that questions pod, um, type a hello, hi, just make sure you know how it works and where it's located. This webinar is being recorded. Providing that the recording is successful, the YouTube link and the presentations will be emailed to all participants and uploaded to our LTAP website. I want to thank you in advance for your participation with that, and I'm going to pass things off to Mr. Tim Keller, Administrator for the Office of Structural Engineering. Tim? Thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. Um, what are we here to do today? Right? Um, you're going to spend a couple hours with us today. And, and the goal is to is to give you perspective of one state's um, experience with GFRP. Uh, at the end of this, I'll kind of wrap it up and say where we're going. But but uh, we we've put together a, an interesting group. Everybody that that touches reinforcements reinforcing steel in a project is is here. We have the owners, uh, we have designers, consultants, uh, we have a supplier, a manufacturer, and supplier. Uh, we have a general contractor. We have a rebar contractor. So, so everybody that's kind of uh, involved with this, uh, with reinforcing, uh, is 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 here today to give us a perspective on on uh, on our projects. Um, though many of you probably don't know that we've we've got projects uh, already built with GFRP. Uh, we also have uh, some tools available for you uh, that we'll, we'll talk through. So it's it's kind of a big picture thing. We're, we're not going to spend very much time on any one area of, of GFRP. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time going through specifications. Uh, this is a, this is our experience. Uh, there's a, a great deal of information available out there on GFRP. Uh, so with that, uh, Dave, uh, let's let's kick this off. Uh, we're going to go two hours straight. We're not going to take a, a break. Um, so so for those of you that need a break, uh, you know. To do do what you need to do, but uh, we will not um, we will not take a break in the presentations. So, Dave, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you uh, to kick us off. All right, thanks, Tim. Uh, David Geckel, District Bridge Engineer of uh, ODOT District Two. Um, I'm going to go through a little bit of what we have done so far uh, with GFRP in our district. Um, if you're not familiar with with uh, ODOT or or how our districts are laid out. Uh, District 2 is up in the northwest corner of the state. We cover about eight counties in the northwest uh, corner of the state, including the Toledo metropolitan area. Our headquarters is in Bowling Green. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little bit of the projects that we have done so far with GFRP. Um, our first project with GFRP is the Lucas uh, 25 bridge. Um, it's, a, it's, on a, it's on an arterial route into the city of Toledo. It's pretty close to downtown Toledo. Um, it's the bridge is over at Norfolk Southern Railroad, which is uh, Norfolk Southern told us it's the busiest railroad track they have in the country. So uh, getting track time in order to be able to do any type of work on, on this particular structure was a, 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 a challenge. So um, we thought early on in the process, it'd probably be a good idea if we could use uh, any type of alternative materials we had to try to extend the life of the, of the bridge, uh, you know, beyond what we would normally anticipate. Um, so our first project was was this Lucas 25 bridge. Uh, it was the first uh, GFRP bridge deck in the state of Ohio. Uh, the project sold in the spring of 2018 um, for around 9.9 .9 million dollars. Uh, it completed in the fall of, of 2019, um, and we had about 345,000 lineal feet of GFRP reinforcing on this bridge. So this is just a couple of pictures. I'm going to show a few pictures of. Uh, of uh, all the bridges that we've done so far. Uh, basically, it, it, I mean, it, it looks and feels like a normal bridge deck. Um, the placement of the reinforcing, the glass fiber reinforcing is a little bit different, obviously, um, but uh, it's it's much easier to handle. The iron workers can carry a whole bundle of, uh, of uh, GFRP bars to where they need to go on the, on the, on the deck versus carrying one number eight bar, num, num, a few number six bars at a time. Um, this particular bridge we had, uh, it was built in two phases, uh, phase one and phase two. There was enough of an offset between the two phases and a, and a distance that we were able to uh, to lap the GFRP bars because uh, we did not have a, a mechanical splice at the time. Um, so we were able to lap the GFRP bars on this particular bridge. 
Uh, this is just a picture of the completed structure. Uh, again, it carries about six lanes of traffic uh, into downtown Toledo and out of downtown Toledo. Um, so we took that experience from our first bridge on the trail, uh, Anthony Wayne Trail, and uh, we had a, an, an interstate uh, widening project that was upcoming uh, to widen four bridges on mainline 475 around the outer belt of Toledo. Um, we uh, we wanted to continue our use of, of glass fiber reinforcing, so this seemed to be a good project to be able to do that with. Um, so we sold, we had four mainline bridges, two sets of twin structures on uh, 475 that we sold as part of the widening. Uh, it was about a $45 million project sold in the fall of 2019. Uh, so about seven million of that was bridge cost. Um, this project was completed in the summer of 2021, and it in, entailed about 466,000 feet of GFRP reinforcement. Um, again, just a couple of pictures from from the construction of this project. Again, it it, it looks and feels just like a normal uh, epoxy coated reinforcing steel uh, structure. And this is a completed. A picture of the completed bridge. Um, again, so we took uh, what we learned on on those on that project with those four bridges. Um, we took it to a fifth bridge, and this one was actually a brand new uh, river crossing of the Maumee River in Napoleon, Ohio, um, which is a, about a half an hour west of the Toledo area. Um, we had a, a new bridge, obviously, that we constructed. It was a project sold for around 10.3 million dollars in the fall of 2019. Um, it just opened up the traffic about a couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. Uh, this was the largest um, undertaking so far for us for GFRP reinforcing. Uh, we had about 470,000 lineal feet of GFRP bars uh, in this particular structure. Um, and there's a, a picture of the completed bridge along with the, the deck as, as we uh, completed the GFRP reinforcing. Uh, eight span bridge across the Maumee River. It was, it was a pretty good sized structure for us to, to use exclusively GFRP reinforcing um, in the deck. Um, so we had a couple more bridges here that we designed and built. Um, we just got uh, these two completed in the in the fall of 2021 here, uh, but we redecked a couple of bridges on um, county roads over I-75 right down from our Bowling Green headquarters here in Bowling Green. Um, but uh, two two bridge redecks that we sold in the spring of 2021 for around 2.7 million. Uh, we completed them both in the summer of 2021. Um, the two combined had about 188,000 lineal feet of GFRP reinforcement. And again, just a couple of pictures of the uh, projects under construction and then the completed bridge structure. Um, I should go back and say that the uh, on the uh, the hill and door uh, mainline 475 structures that we did, um, those bridges were also phase construction. And at the time when we when we bid the projects, we we were anticipating uh, a mechanical splice that would be able to to uh, to be able to splice the bars together between the phase joints because there was not enough room on that one to be able to to lap the bars. Um, we did not end up having an, uh, an approved mechanical splice by the time we needed for uh, construction. So what we did is we uh, we ended up splicing a stainless steel bar across the phase joint. So we spliced stainless steel bar into the uh, GFRP to get across the phase joint since we didn't have a mechanical splice. Um, so district two, our summary so far, we have eight bridge decks that are in service with GFRP reinforcing. Uh, we have one more that we bid out uh, probably a month and a half ago um, that will, will be constructed next spring uh, and complete early next summer. Um, so in total, we've used about one and a half million line, lineal feet of GFRP reinforcing to date. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit about hydro demolition. Um, I guess when we started using GFRP, we assumed that we would not be able to um, hydro demo any of the any of the bridge decks uh, that that contain GFRP just due to, to to due to the nature of the material um, that we wouldn't be able to do it. Um, we actually, we had a, a large hydro demolition project going on on one of our projects up here. Um, so we actually uh, did a little bit of a test uh, of, of hydro demolition on GFRP. Um, so hydro demolition, it's a, it's a common practice for ODOT to use hydro demolition uh, to prepare concrete decks prior to the placement of rigid overlays. 
Um, on average, we do about $15 million worth of, of uh, hydro demolition work and overlay work in the state of Ohio yearly. Uh, so we wanted to know ultimately if hydro demolition uh, on, a, on a bridge deck with GFRP was possible. So what did we do? We built a, uh, a test slab. Uh, so we, we went out to our, our big construction project. We, we formed up and, and built a 40 foot test slab uh, with varying sizes of, of glass fiber reinforced uh, bars. Uh, you can see in the middle of that picture, we we did spray some spray foam on it, a section just to see how that would act, uh, kind of to mimic what uh, a failed bridge deck overlay uh, would look like. Uh, we just wanted to see what it would, would do to the GFRP. Um, poured it with some really bad concrete. We told the contractor we wanted about 2,500 PSI uh, material to, again, to mimic what uh, a bridge deck would look like when when we get to it with hydro demolition. Um, we created, you can see there's a little divot out here. We man-made that when we poured the deck just to kind of mimic more of the, uh, the conditions that we see when we get out to a bridge. Um, for those of you that haven't seen a hydro demolition machine, this is what a hydro demolition machine looks like. Um, it sprays water out of the underneath the shroud up front with a very high pressure um, there there are a lot of adjustable settings on a hydro demolition machine um, you can adjust the water pressure um, you can adjust the time that it takes to make one pass or two passes um, you can adjust how many passes it makes before it makes a step uh, longitudinally on the bridge deck um, you can also adjust the travel distance um, that it passes um, after each pass um, so we, we did a lot of testing on this 40 foot slab. We did a lot of uh, different settings uh, pressure wise. Uh, we did some with one pass, some with two passes before it made a step. Um, and we kind of, um, I guess, saw what the results were. Um, in the end, uh, this is some pictures of our completed test slab. Um, you can see the little test sections that we did at different pressures, different settings on the machine. Um, and I got some closer up pictures of what the, the hydro demolition machine did to the GFRP bars. Um, you can see there is um, some damage. Uh, basically, we set it um, when we when we run on a normal epoxy coated reinforced bridge deck for an overlay, uh, we run around 16,000 PSI. Uh, we tried 16,000 PSI on the GFRP and it did quite a bit of damage to the GFRP bars. Um, so we, we brought the pressure down to a more reasonable, what we thought would still create the surface that we were looking for, um, but still get the deteriorated concrete out. Um, we got down to 11,000 PSI, um, and we really didn't see much damage to the GFRP bars at all. Um, this picture, I believe, was around 13,000 PSI. Um, you can see it it's, uh, scuffed the bars a little bit, but overall, um, it didn't really damage uh, the bars as we had anticipated. Um, so this picture here would bend from a higher setting on the pressure, um, and you can kind of see where it it pretty much destroyed um, one of those bars. So I guess I'm going to turn it over to Tim and maybe talk about what we learned uh, from our hydro demolition. Okay. Um, the good news is that we can hydro demolition a, a, a bridge deck with GFRP. Uh, the bad news is most likely you're going to do some damage to the bars. Now, um, what, what it also means is uh, the owner has to um, do, do their work a little differently. Um, you know, bringing out the hydro machine, put the settings in, and off you go is not, is not what we're going to be able to do. We're going to have to work with the, with the operator. Uh, luckily, on this project, we had a great operator with the hydro machine. We're going to have to work with them to um, with our settings. Um, you know, we set this one up with very bad concrete. Um, hopefully, you don't have that 2,500 pound concrete in 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 your bridge decks. I'm hoping we don't either. So, so you're going to have to uh, the first section of the deck. You're going to have to continually to um, change the settings, change and and until you get it to the point where. Uh, you're confident that you'll do very little damage from there on out. But that first section, you're probably going to do some damage as you're as you're playing with the with the settings. And so, um, Ohio, we 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 do a considerable amount of hydro demolition. 
we don't plan on. Uh, so in this case, with with GFRP, we'll be able to continue to that process. Uh, we think it 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 um, it does a great job of preparing our bridge decks for the overlay. Uh, and, and the big question we have uh, that's 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 the big unknown is uh, but the use of GFRP, how long will it take before we need to get to our overlay? Um, for those that have told me that uh, using GFRP, you won't get to an overlay, I, I'm skeptical. Let's put it that way. Um, I wish that uh, 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 the rusting reinforcement was the only reason we needed to that, that damaged our decks um, so I do think we will still using GFRP I think we still need to be able to uh, put an overlay down um, this little test uh, proved that we can do it um, but be prepared to, to that you will have some damaged GFRP parts especially at the beginning when you're playing around with uh, with the settings to try and and get it to the point where you you have very limited to to no damage so that's what we learned um it was a great experience um so so uh with that uh let's let's uh let's move to the next one yeah and next i'll turn one. it over to Sean Metals in our office of structural engineering for uh his presentation All right, thanks, Tim. Thanks, Dave. Um, my name is uh, Sean Metals. I oversee the development and maintenance of our bridge design policy documents for ODOT. Um, those documents include the bridge design manual and the standard bridge drawings. I also help the Office of Construction Administration uh, with the development and maintenance of the construction and material specifications. Um, all that kind of comes into play with uh, when we're talking about new materials uh, for use in the bridge decks here. So um, what I'm going to do today is briefly talk about um, how a designer would specify GFRP reinforcement uh, for a bridge deck. Um, first, I, I'll just give you a brief background on, um, on ODOT's history with GFRP reinforcement. Um, for a long time, well, I, I don't know how much it's been used, but ODOT has allowed the use of GFRP uh, at uh, concrete pavement joints uh, in the dowel baskets, uh, but we, we never really utilize it in a structural application. Uh, in 2013, ODOT uh, started using GFRP reinforcement in our concrete bridge railings. Um, we, we located it where we cut, we do a full depth saw cut on our deflection joints. Um, the, the idea there was that the GR, GFRP would, would be useful for strengthening cage uh, for slip forming or, or you know, the concrete pour itself. But when we cut through it, we wouldn't have to worry about any uh, deterioration uh, forming at those locations. Um, these bar, the GFRP bars were sacrificial. We did not really have a material requirement for them other than just specified GFRP reinforcement. Um, and the bars were not considered in the structural capacity uh, for the railing. Shortly after we started uh, implementing the SBR 113 drawing, which, which you're looking at details here, um, our office began receiving uh, contractor request to provide GFRP for the full length of the, of the barrier runs. Um, since GFRP reinforcement and reinforcing steel do not possess the equivalent resistance uh, based on the bar size, we really couldn't grant these requests without uh, an appropriate design. So in January of 2020, our office developed and released a fully GFRP reinforced concrete bridge railing. Uh, now, when I say fully reinforced, what I'm really talking about is just the, the horizontal or the longitudinal reinforcement in the barriers. Uh, now, the idea was we get the same benefit that we can still provide our saw cut joints and cut through the reinforcement and not worry about deterioration of those joints. Um, but we, I, I do want to make it clear that ODOT does still utilize uh, steel, epoxy coated steel reinforcement 
for the vertical reinforcement in, in the concrete barriers. But obviously when we are introducing this, which is now a structural use of the GFRP, we do need that new material and construction specifications to go along with it. Um, so, so what we had to do is we had to modify our, the first, the first document that we needed to modify was our construction specification, which is in ODOT Construction and Material Specifications book and it's item 509. Um, the, the specification itself had to be completely rewritten. Uh, originally, that section was titled Reinforcing Steel, so it's now been retitled to Concrete Reinforcement. Um, some of the changes that we did address in the, in the section in order to, um, to make it useful for GFRP reinforcement, uh, we addressed how the, the, the material you need to use for the uh, GFRP ties. Uh, we, we, we talk about permissible damage that, that will be allowed for the GFRP reinforcement. We talk about limitations on field fabrication um, that, that is also uh, applies to GFRP. Um, unlike steel reinforcement, ODOT pays for GFR reinf reinforcement in, in feet. Uh, for, for steel reinforcement, we pay in pounds. Uh, we pay in feet based on the size of the bar. Uh, the final quantity that you will see in the plans represents the total length of GFR reinforcement for that size. Um, this was done because unlike reinforcing steel, the weight based on the suppliers is not uniform for GFRP. And the one I guess the one variable that we had that was uh, uniform is is the amount of feet of the reinforcement. So that's that's why that was done for the basis of payment. Um, material specification again, we turn to the ODOT CMS. It's uh, item seven hundred five twenty eight in the material specs. Uh, this was a completely new material specification that did not exist. Uh, essentially, what we do is we reference ASTM D7957, which is uh, which covers GFRP reinforcement. But we do have a twist. We've modified the modulus of elasticity. We've increased it from 6,500 KSI to 8,700 KSI. And that was based on conversations that we had uh, with industry representatives. Uh, ODOT was influenced to to make this change because um, there really was a, neg ne a negligible increase in cost. Um, we had multiple suppliers that could supply it with higher modules of elasticity. And it also kind of closes that design gap a little bit between reinforcing steel and GFRP so we can take advantages of, of that as well. One of the additional uh, documents or, you know, I guess documents that ODOT created was Supplement uh, 1138. Uh, that created an ODOT GFRP certification, uh, supplier certification program. Uh, currently, ODOT now has two uh, suppliers uh, supplying G that can supply GFRP reinforcement for uh, ODOT projects. Uh, B and B FRP manufacturing. Uh, they're out of New York, and Owens Corning actually has two two sites that can supply uh, GFRP reinforcement. Uh, one is in Blythewood, South Carolina. The other is in Concord, North Carolina. Um, in order to uh, specify, have items to specify in the plans. Uh, we had to go into our item master, which lists every item that's available for uh, ODOT construction. Uh, we added 18 new pay items. Um, for those that are interested, that they, they kind of gives the range of the item numbers there. Essentially, we added um, pay items for each of the bar sizes. Uh, we've got, you know, number blank GFRP deformed bars or we've got number blank GFRP to four bars as per plan. So if, if you need a modification, somehow you've got the as per plan item. 
Uh, we list uh, bar sizes from number two to number 10 um, and make those available for, for bidding purposes. Uh, the last thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, we do schedule these bars. So we provide a um, reinforcing steel schedule in the plans. Uh, what you're seeing here is an example. This is actually comes from our um, 42 inch concrete uh, bridge drilling standard drawing. Um, but, but as you see, the, the, the scheduling is very similar. The one thing we've done is we've added a column for the material so that it's clear what material we're asking for. Uh, that's, that's all I've got today for um, specifying GFRP reinforcement. At this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Tim Sheldon from E.L. Robinson to talk about uh, design uh, and use in, in bridge decks. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, my name is Tim Sheldon. I am a bridge engineer with E.L. Robinson Engineering, and uh, we have been working with Owens Corning as kind of a design consultant to uh, help them develop tools to uh, simplify some of the design process for GFRP reinforcing. One of the main things we've just finished up producing is a uh, deck design table for use in Ohio. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about that, talk a little bit about um, the design of GFRP reinforcing. So um, where do things currently stand in the state of Ohio with uh, deck reinforcing design? Um, in ODOT's bridge design manual, there is a, a deck reinforcing design table that was developed for epoxy coated steel reinforcing bars uh, that meets all of ODOT's requirements. And you know they've done all the design for you and you can basically just go in there, uh, determine your beam spacing and effective span and go into the chart and it will give you all of the uh, reinforcing that you'll need, your bar spacing and whatnot. And so uh, our aim was to reproduce that with uh, GFRP reinforcing. So um, we've gone ahead and done that. We've gone through, looked at all of the, the current uh, GFRP design specs and, and basically tried to mirror uh, what ODOT had done with their, with their steel reinforcing uh, deck design table um, with the goal of just simplifying GFRP uh, deck design. So uh, this, this will be useful for both uh, designers. You can go in there and, uh, and figure out what your deck design is gonna be. Um, it can also be useful for owners who want to make uh, some sort of comparison between uh, you know, steel and uh, GFRP. You know, if you have a steel deck and you're curious what it would be as a GFRP deck, you can go in and see what the bars would be and uh, just go from there. Um, so, uh, in order to develop this, we use basically all of the typical, typical assumptions that are present for the, the steel deck design table. Um, use the standard maximum overhangs, four feet. Um, it's valid for um, all of the standard ODOT barriers, future wearing surface and whatnot. Um, and then get, getting into design a little bit, there's a there's two different design methodologies for decks. There's the traditional design methodology and the empirical design methodology. And, and uh, we ended up using the traditional, which, which parallels what ODOT did with the uh, steel reinforcing design tables. Um, so one of the things when uh, working with GFRP reinforcing is that uh, with steel, they make the bars as a straight bar and then they can bend them to whatever shape they need to be. Um, with GFRP reinforcing, uh, there are some more limitations in terms of what bars, what shapes of bars can actually be fabricated uh, because those bars actually have to be uh, made in the shape that uh, they'll be in in the final configuration. Um, so where, where that, where that plays into the deck design is uh, an overhang section. Um, so typically uh, with ODOT's bars, you would have a 180 degree hook in your main reinforcing bars at the edge of deck, and then you'd have an additional bar that you would add next to that to provide that additional strength needed for that overhang. Um, in terms of what's actually, what's actually constructible, 
Um, this, this hook bar can be constructed a maximum length of up to nine feet. Um, so what that ends up meaning is uh, you, you would have to introduce a lap splice uh, at that point in the deck. Um, now, as a part of our uh, deck design tables, we've, we've provided information in there, uh, which, which will give a designer all of the guidance that they need uh, in, terms of, in terms of these types of requirements. Um, but that's just something to be aware of when actually going ahead and doing a uh, deck design. Uh, so just talk a little bit about um, some of the differences between differences in design between uh, GFRP and steel reinforcing. Um, what you'll notice here is that the GFRP bars are a lot stronger. They they go all the way up to you know 100, 110, 120, 130 KSI before uh, they do rupture. But they do they do rupture. It's a you know it's a brittle, sudden failure rather than steel where uh, we sort of rely on all of this post-yielding uh, ductility. Um, and so what, with, with steel, when we're designing for uh, moment reinforcing, uh, we can actually get pretty close up to that, that full yield strength. Uh, we, the, you know, the fee reduction factors that we use in design are only 0.9 for a, a tension-controlled uh, steel section, whereas uh, with GFRP, you, know, you have 110, 120, 130 KSI, but but uh, you're applying a, a 0.55 reduction factor to that uh, for that, you know, for that uh, bar failure limit state. Um, the other thing you'll notice is that the, the bars are also uh, more flexible than, than what you find with uh, steel reinforcing. The steel reinforcing has a modulus of, uh, stiffness modulus of 29,000 KSI, whereas GFRP is down in the, as Sean mentioned, the 8,700. KSI range. So um, once you get into design, you know a lot. A lot of times, what ends up controlling design for steel reinforcing is uh, you know the strength limit states. You know how much how much can the bar handle uh, with with the additional uh, flexibility and and the the lower stiffness of the GFRP reinforcing bars, um, the the serviceability, the, the crack control, and, and and uh, things related to that bar stiffness um, can end up controlling more often. And actually, in the case with uh, bridge deck designs, uh, we were finding that uh, that ended up often being the uh, the limit state that that controlled it from a design perspective. Um, another thing to think about when doing design with uh, GFRP reinforcing index is uh, load rating and beam design. Uh, traditionally, when you're doing a steel beam design in a bridge, uh, you find that the reinforcing steel that's placed over the piers actually becomes a part of your beam analysis and becomes a part of your load rating because that steel uh, is relied on it as part of the stiffness of the, the total section, the, the combination of the beam and the uh, GFRP. Um, and so with GFRP, uh, you do have a difference there in that, that the bars are, you know, they're not as stiff as what's in, uh, or as, as the steel reinforcing bars. So um, in order to do load rating and beam design, um, not a lot of design programs have, uh, you know, an input, a standard input for GFRP reinforcing. So uh, in order to make that work, you do have to, uh, modify, you know, modify the area or stiffness as appropriate of those GFRP bars so that they behave uh, in their true manner with that, you know, with that 8,700 KSI uh, stiffness modulus instead of the uh, 29,000 KSI stiffness modulus of steel. Um, so kind of a, kind of why now, you know, so fairly recently uh, ODOT released their second edition of their uh, GFRP uh, guide spec uh, for bridge design, um, and so the materials the materials been around for some time, but uh, as as time has gone on and research as research has been done and manufacturers make improvements, um, some of the conservatism 
uh, is getting removed from the initial design. So when you start with a material, you kind of start, you know, overly conservative because you don't know how it's going to behave long term. And you know, as as data gets out there and and whatnot, you kind of start to remove some of that conservatism. And and uh, these bars have been in use in Canada for quite some time, uh, going on potentially 20, 30 years uh, in their decks. Um, and so the second edition of the GFRP guide spec did uh, take some of that out of there. And, you know, from a design perspective, that that makes it uh, more, it makes it closer to what you would see with steel. You're just, you're not, you're not needing as many bars or, you know, as, as much material to uh, meet your design requirements. Um, so that's kind of what's, what we've seen up to this point. Um, moving forward, um, there are some additional additional things on the horizon that could be improved. Um, for example, uh, the ACI 440 committee is is uh, an ACI committee that deals with FRP reinforcing, and they've already approved um, some improvements in in different design factors that we use. For example, this environmental reduction factor. They've already improved an increase in that number, um, which will likely make it into AASHTO specifications and then can be used in bridge design. Um, also, uh, in our experience with Owens Corning, uh, we learned that manufacturers are working on improvements to bar strength, uh, bar modules of elasticity, making the bar stiffer. Um, you know, that 8,700 KSI could go up to 9,000, 9,200, uh, depending on where they land. Um, and, and all of that's gonna play into the deck reinforcing design tables. And so the ones that we've developed are a, they're a snapshot of what today's values are. Um, and just with, just with the improvements that uh, we're seeing here, um, you know, we're maybe looking at another potentially five, seven percent increase or five to seven percent improvement in terms of what the design table will look like. Um, so if and or when those those numbers come out and make it into ODOT specifications, make it into uh, you know global specifications like ACHTO, uh, once that happens, we'll go ahead and update those design tables with these improved values. Um, so you will see that improvement as as time goes on. Um, so we've done the, the deck design tables um, just from a, a designer's perspective, um, you know, potential, you know, sim similar similar types of items where you could see GFRP in the future could be uh, approach slabs or concrete slab bridges. Um, we are, we've been working with Owens Corning and we're in talks on uh, potentially developing some, some details related to those, but uh, that's just to kind of give you an idea of, of where that that may be going from our perspective. Um, and lastly, so we've developed this design table. Um, where do you find it? Well, um, it is actually hosted on Owens Corning's website, but you can find the link to that in the ODOT's Office of Structural Engineering, their industry resources page. Um, that will take you right to Owens Corning's website. And and it'll take you right to that design table. Um, the other way that you can find that design table is on Owens Corning's website under their uh, their GFRP bar section under the specification, specifications and literature. Uh, they do have a direct link to that design table. So uh, that's just kind of want to let you guys know that uh, that's where we're at uh, and that those resources are available to you. Um, and so with that, I'm going to pass it on to Dave Hartman with Owens Corning. Thank you, Tim. I'd like to uh, present from a manufacturer's perspective a consistent and reliable supply of the GFRP uh, rebar. Uh, my colleague, uh, Mikhail Vorobiev, and myself, uh, Dave Hartman, 
have been uh, working with the state of Ohio and uh, through the DOT and their partners, we are very interested in uh, supporting and ensuring the uh, success of the uh, GFRP uh, rebar. Owens Corning is a global building and industrial materials leader. We're headquartered in Toledo, Ohio, and uh, we are uh, global with 19,000 employees in 33 countries. Uh, we have three integrated businesses uh, serving residential, uh, commercial, and industrial markets. And uh, our focus is uh, looking at this in the uh, transportation uh, structures with um, several different uh, products and the fiberglass reinforcement solutions for uh, civil or heavy construction, as Tim mentioned, uh, meets the ASTM D7957 uh, GFRP uh, material specification. And this ensures that we have a durable uh, solution. The uh, Mateen Bar fiberglass rebar is, um, as we've mentioned several uh, job sites, is showing uh, good bid history and is uh, considered an economic concrete reinforcement solution versus the uh, corrosion resistant uh, steel reinforcement. Uh, besides uh, bridge decks, we've also been working uh, as concrete reinforcement in seawalls and the uh, dowel bars uh, from Owens Corning, the fiberglass dowels are used in uh, jointed paving of, of highway structures. The um, other area is in residential, uh, light commercial buildings, uh, where we look at fiberglass rebar for flat work, uh, crack mitigation for slab on ground and agricultural pads, driveways, and uh, industrial pads. And this is our pink bar uh, fiberglass uh, rebar. One of the uh, significant uh, learnings in working with these is the need to uh, be able to uh, produce in the United States. And in our Concord facility, uh, where we're transitioning uh, uh, Blythewood, uh, we are currently manufacturing uh, using the Owens Corning uh, Type 30 single end roving fiberglass that uh, originates from our Amarillo, Texas uh, composites facility. We have a, uh, a diverse team of workers. Uh, you see here the uh, continuous uh, process of uh, poltrusion where we feed in the uh, fiberglass uh, reinforcements and uh, then we uh, consolidate that into uh, a uh, rebar structure. And with the uh, interest that we have in, in um, understanding what the uh, demand and growth is, we are in the process of scaling this facility uh, to uh, meet uh, the uh, demand. The key benefits uh, that have already been discussed around the, uh, uh, the GFRP rebar is the improved durability. Uh, there's no corrosion, uh, which means that there's no spalling or or uh, degradation from the, uh, the rust of the reinforcement. Uh, it's lightweight. Um, we see uh, labor savings uh, up to 50% reduction of, of labor hours. Uh, we, we also have noted uh, the improved working conditions and safety from a health perspective. Uh, the uh, GFRP rebar is one fourth the weight of steel, but still provides uh, twice the uh, strength of steel. Uh, we've been uh, challenged to uh, supply a consistent uh, material, but we also have consistent raw material prices versus steel. This enables a lower first installed cost uh, versus corrosion resistant steel, and there is no need for expensive overlays or add mixtures to the uh, concrete uh, as as there typically is for steel. The GFRP rebar also has unique properties for uh, special applications. The electromagnetic neutrality and the elect electrically and thermally non-conductive nature of this material uh, allows it to be used, for example, in a toll booth 
areas of construction on turnpikes or other highways. And uh, we also have uh, been able to uh, be used in building construction of uh, hospitals, for example, without uh, issues with the NMR or, or special equipment that's used in the hospitals. To uh, ensure the uh, performance of the GFRP rebar, that it is uh, consistent, reliable, and that it does have uh, design credibility across the uh, uh, 20 or so years that Tim mentioned. The American Concrete Institute uh, has the ACI 440.1R-15 guide for design and construction, and also section 508 for specification of constructability with the uh, GFRP. It calls out the uh, ASTM D7957 material standards. Uh, for transportation structures, where we're mostly engaged here, the AASHTO L LRFD uh, bridge design guide has the specifications for GFRP reinforced concrete. And as Tim mentioned recently, the BDG2 uh, uh, enabled uh, improvements of the conservatism uh, for um, the specifications. And then we have specific uh, Ohio uh, DOT specifications for GFRP rebar and design guidelines. Uh, and those also exist for other state uh, DOTs. The uh, ASTM D7957 details the uh, material specifications, and that includes uh, by bar diameter, which there are tolerances, and those uh, tolerances are insured uh, with the, uh, the die of a uh, specific machine diameter uh, in the pultrusion process. As we take the uh, glass fiber uh, through uh, the uh, resin and the uh, consolidation in the dies, we can ensure uh, with a good natural tolerance that we, uh, that we meet the uh, specifications on diameter and cross-sectional area. And uh, that enables us to uh, appropriately uh, for substitution of steel uh, meet at similar bar diameters the uh, requirements uh, to, uh, to the uh, designs relative to, for example, the bridge deck. The form factor uh, that we've uh, moved to is a helical ground structure uh, shown in the middle of the uh, industry available form factors. And as we look at um, those uh, tolerances uh, being uh, validated uh, and consistent in our process, we also certify those, as uh, Sean mentioned earlier. We supply a, a C of A uh, with the uh, shipment uh, that's tied in with the uh, QPL with ODOT and, uh, and done according to uh, the certification for supplement uh, 1138 with ODOT. Uh, this certificate of analysis uh, not only ensures the uh, dimensions, uh, but also the uh, amount of glass fiber that is used to ensure the higher uh, elastic modulus, the uh, higher strength uh, that we are capable of in our uh, Concord uh, facility. Also, the bar is marked. Uh, for uh, traceability and to tie it in with the uh, C of A. When we look at the uh, sizes uh, that are available, uh, the straight bars, they're similar to the bar diameters for steel from a number two to a number 12. Uh, stock lengths are usually uh, 20 foot, uh, 40 foot, uh, 60 foot. We can have special order up to uh, 80 foot. And uh, as Sean mentioned, easier it's sold on a linear uh, foot or, or meter basis versus the price for the price per unit weight. The um, bridge uh, design oftentimes requires a bent bar and the uh, prefabricated bent bars produced in our Concord facility uh, range in bar diameter from a number three to a number eight. Uh, these um, Simple bent bar uh, details are, are given and available uh, on the site that uh, Tim mentioned. And we make these to stock and then some, some shapes are also made to order 
and are available. Uh, we do not uh, bend the bars in the field, uh, but we do provide most of the steel uh, bent shapes, uh, except for like a, a Z uh, structure. Uh, I think the uh, key thing around the, uh, the bend is uh, any strength reduction that occurs in the bend itself is accounted for in the uh, design guides. Uh, so uh, as we uh, look at the use of these uh, uh, GFRP uh, straight bars and uh, bent bars uh, in 200 plus installations in the USA and 200 plus in uh, Canada, uh, the map here for the US show and shows uh, for uh, example the range of coastal areas, uh, freeze thaw areas and in uh, both the Northeast and the Midwest and on into Canada. Uh, we have 22 states now that have used GFRP in uh, not just the uh, bridges and traffic barriers, but also we're looking uh, coastal at sea walls and uh, abutment walls for uh, bridges, retaining walls and so forth. During the past uh, 20 years, um, we've seen good service. Uh, the American Concrete Institute uh, Strategic Development uh, Council uh, authorized a study to uh, prove the durability. And in looking at the extracted uh, uh, core samples across uh, 11 or 12 different locations, uh, we saw uh, negligible evidence of the GFRP rebar uh, being negatively affected by the concrete environment after over 15 years in service. Um, this was much less than expected. You know, as we look at uh, what is predicted by the accelerated test methodology, and it had negligible impact on mechan mechanical properties. Typically, the accelerated test, uh, we call out uh, needing to have a residual uh, over 80% of the original strength, and uh, we're well above 90%. Um, in uh, the actual uh, residual tensile from these uh, core samples that were pulled. Uh, the current ASTM D7957 limits are then significantly greater uh, than the core samples that we extracted. And another note is that today's products are better than in 2000 and performing better uh, in the accelerated aging protocol. So uh, very conservative from the standpoint of um, the corrosion resistance, uh, and this is what's enabling uh, the GFR being corrosion free. The two examples that I'd like to uh, highlight uh, that uh, uh, Dave uh, mentioned earlier were the Anthony Wayne Trail Bridge. This was a significant uh, project that allowed us to, uh, to begin to understand uh, what was needed uh, to improve our GFRP offering. Uh, we uh, then moved uh, more recently uh, in the Henry County Liberty Bridge, and uh, we introduced the uh, higher modulus uh, and higher strength uh, product and uh, the um, load capability uh, for those bars are, are much improved from previous offerings. And so we are typically 30% uh, higher than the ASTM D7957 material specification. And, and this is why Sean mentioned that uh, ODOT uh, wants to take advantage of that and ties that in uh, with uh, special notes on top of the ASTM D7957. So in conclusion, fiberglass rebar is a safe, reliable, and cost-effective uh, reinforcement. We've seen this in, in multiple projects, not just in Ohio, but across North America and globally. Uh, we see easier handling and installation compared with uh, traditional steel. And this is uh, uh, leading to increased productivity and improved working conditions from a, from a health perspective. Across thousands of reinforced concrete structures, uh, where, where we're building those with fiberglass, we're learning uh, not only the constructability and the serviceability issues have been raised. Uh, most recently, uh, we uh, looked at uh, using the ground penetrating re rebar system for, excuse me, radar system 
uh, to detect uh, the fiberglass rebars, and uh, we're, we're being sure that that capability exists to allow um, serviceability of the, uh, of the bridge decks. Uh, we have a durable reinforced concrete structure that uh, is capable of increased service life. Uh, we're saying out to 100 years. Uh, this should benefit the entire uh, ecosystem. We have a complete and mature set of guides. Test methodology and standards are available. Uh, and this is for a non-proprietary solution that exists within the traditional supply chain uh, for acquisition and installation uh, today. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Kevin uh, Gothberg. Thank you for your attention. I'm waiting to get a pass over screen there. There we are. All right, hello, my name is Kevin Gothberg. I am a lead project engineer for Cocosin Construction Company. We are a, a good sized general contractor in the uh, Midwest and some in the uh, Mid-Atlantic. So in any event, uh, from a general contractor perspective, uh, rebar for the most part for us is a, uh, a pass-through cost. Uh, we will get a price from the uh, supplier to furnish the material. We will get a price from the rebar subcontractor to place the material. Uh, typically, the general contractor costs are uh, the rebar supports, which there will be no change between GFRP and steel, and then our unloading and hoisting costs. Um, since the material is, is quite a bit lighter, you will be able to get a savings potentially on uh, equipment. Uh, depends on what the contractor has available at the time, if it's moving in or out. Um, a lot of times, I would say the equipment that would be there for steel would be the same equipment that's going to be there for GFRP. So there's potentially that, that cost isn't going to, uh, to change. Uh, the other issue that a contractor is going to be uh, looking at is schedule and availability of material. Um, right now, uh, the, the even reinforcing steel, we're having uh, lead times roughly 10 weeks, eight to, eight to 10 weeks, just to get rebar orders placed and, and brought to the project. And in conversations with uh, Owens Corning, it sounds like uh, they could potentially even beat that time. All right. Um, just another picture. So, uh, schedule availability of material, like I said, it's uh, six to 10 weeks' time. Um, getting a replacement bar. Um, a lot of times, uh, just rebar itself will uh, disappear on us from uh, either people scrapping or misplacing on, on the job site. Uh, with the uh, steel suppliers, we can typically get bars replaced within two or three days if we have a decent relationship with them. It's a lot easier to get a replacement bar than to place full orders. Uh, they do work with us on that. Um, so that would be one issue to work with the uh, the, the fiber uh, suppliers with. Uh, the other thing we can do on site to mention it is field bending of, of steel um, with hickey bars, uh, other techniques. We can bend the rebar on site to miss obstructions, or if we had a if we're missing a bent bar, if we have to bend one ourselves, we can do that. That is not a possibility with GRF GFRP, so that would be one concern. Um, if uh, so the, the supply of the material, that would be the concerns there. And it, it sounds like we're all, all right in talking with Owens Corning. Um, duration, um, if, the, if there is truly a labor savings, we'll let the, the rebar subcontractors discuss that next. If there is, is a duration savings, that will definitely help the schedule and that would be an advantage to the contractor. Um, yeah. So really, as long as the material is available at, from a general contractor, I, I really don't see it being a, a difference one way or the other. It's definitely not a, a distraction or a, or a concern for us. Um, ways a contractor, you, you might see it coming from uh, from us. 
if, if we're seeing a, a material savings and a labor savings, you might see uh, contractors uh, bring up value engineering proposals that would help. Uh, if the material is allowed by specification, if it's cheaper, the uh, contractors might put it in like a design build type uh, situation. If it gives us a lower price, we will we will go that route. If the material were allowed by specification as a uh, substitute, if the price is less, a contractor will take advantage of that during the bid to uh, pass that savings on. So really the, the general theme here is that the, the lower the cost, either before or after the bid, a, a contractor is going to be interested. Um, if we can lower our bid, we will take any advantage we can to do that. Um, but uh, obviously, if there is a savings to be had, if it's specified initially, you guys will get the, if, if we're doing it pre-bid, you'll see the savings. If it's post-bid, it's uh, obviously more of an advantage to the contractor because all of a sudden we're not bidding against the field. We only have, a, we're only bidding against ourselves at that point. So quick little presentation, um, sum it up. If the cost is lower, contractors will be for it. Uh, I really don't see any downsides on the constructability side or, or schedule side on the GC from, from what I'm hearing from Owens Corning and the availability to get the short orders quickly. Um, and the, uh, the steel's pretty volatile right now as well. And as the steel prices go up, the scrap prices are going to be higher and we're gonna see more shrink on site as well. So that's definitely an advantage for GFRP. So with that said, I will uh, pass this on to Brad Carpenter with uh, Black Swamp Steel, and uh, and he can discuss uh, with the view of someone who's actually put this in place. So thank you for your time. Am I there? Hello, uh, this is Steve Seraki. I'm the president of Black Swarm Steel, a reinforcing steel installer uh, located here in the Midwest. Um, I'll be passing it over to Brad Carpenter pretty soon. He's our senior project manager and he can talk a little more logistically about the boots on the ground perspective. But uh, we have uh, several projects under our belt. It's still a small sample for us as we look back and try and prepare and uh, accumulate historical data. But uh, when this first came to us, we were working with Owens Corning and obviously with ODOT, and we identified a few items up front that we really needed to uh, look at for not only uh, company-wise, but for our employees. And the first item obviously was safety. Uh, we asked ourselves, do we need to adjust our safety plan? And if so, in regards to what areas? Administratively, do we need to change our JSAs? Do we need to change our plans? Uh, physical adjustments, uh, PPP, excuse me, PPE adjustments. So we had many discussions over that from a safety perspective. Brad will elaborate a little more of what changes we've adapted into our program out in the field. We also looked at any contractual issues. There's very little difference contractually between uh, steel rebar and GFRP. Uh, the only items in there are some unit of measures, linear foot versus pounds, uh, calculating final quantities, those types of things. But uh, general general conditions and contract language is very similar. Uh, we also had to look at our estimating and bidding processes. Uh, the, the main one was the unit of measure. Iron workers, estimators in the steel world think in pounds or tons. And uh, after many years of doing that, it, it uh, boggles the mind a little bit to go to the linear foot and how to convert over to that. But uh, it was identified and we've worked on different scenarios and then how does that translate to the field? So based upon that, we also had to look at how are we gonna track our productions out in the field? How will it translate to the job costing? How do we work on this for forecasting going for, forward? And are we really truly able to identify any cost savings along the way? Um, with that said, uh, those are kind of the highbrow issues that I looked at it from a presidential level. Now, Brad here, uh, he's got a presentation. I'll pass it over to him. 
and hopefully it can give you a little more detailed view of uh, what's happening on the ground. Thank you. Okay, hello everybody. So as Steve said, I'm Brad Carpenter with Black Swamp Steel. I'm a senior project manager uh, for our company. Um, we install reinforcing in all types, uh, whether it's reinforcing steel, uh, GFRP or post tensioning. Um, most commonly it, it's, it's reinforcing steel for us, but um, we have done several projects um, with GR, GFRP. Um, the first one was the uh, Anthony Wayne Bridge in the city of Toledo. Uh, that was referred to earlier, ODOT Project 180142. Uh, this is a picture here um, that I want to specifically point out to everybody. Um, if you look at the two guys standing on the, the metal decking there, you'll see that there's three rows of bar supports underneath this GFRP. Um, what we found is uh, with steel, there would have only been two runs there. Um, so we did have to increase the bar supports um, in, in order to help with uh, the way that the bar deflects there is the weight of the people standing on it. Uh, this next picture here, this is also a picture of, of the GFRP being installed. Um, as everybody's referred to, you can see how the guys are carrying multiple bars. And, uh, you know, the significant weight reduction there is, is huge for us. Um, as a labor intensive workforce, our crews are, are working all day, you know, in the heat and and the cold as well as we go into the winter. And, you know, the, as they continue to work throughout the day, you know, typically in DOT construction, we're working 10 hour days. Uh, by the time you get to that seventh, eighth, ninth hour of the day, our guys really tend to, to, to wear out and, and slow down. Um, what we're looking for is, is forward to is with the GFRP being significantly less weight that, that we can maybe sustain our productions in that in those later hours in the day. And then also for that matter, as, as you go on in the week as well, um, there's a significant weight uh, production loss if we work six days a week or even in some cases, seven days a week. So, um, and it's it's mostly related to the amount of weight that our, our crews are, are lifting throughout uh, the day. Um, the other project that we uh, worked on with GFRP um, in Owens Corning was uh, the ODOT door and Hill Street project that was also referred to. Um, this was, um, the twin bridges um, there was a total of four four bridges on this set hill street and, and door as well um, there was about uh, 400,000 linear feet of, of gfrp in this bridge um, so kind of comparing the two um, the weight difference is is massive and um, you know is, is a great thing for our crews as as we we still are going to be needing the use of cranes and, and forklifts or great alls to, to unload the materials. As you can see in the picture on this slide, the, the materials still come bundled, you know, in large bundles, and those bundles will still be a significant weight. But once the bar is distributed out onto the bridge deck by that crane or, or great all or forklift, um, then our crews will, will be lifting these materials by hand. So, um, so one big thing, I saw a question in the comments section here about uh, whether gloves are required or not, and um, they, they definitely are. Um, and one other thing we've noticed through installing the, the GFRP is that you also should wear long sleeves as well. Um, if you touch the, the GFRP by hand and or slide your hand across it, um, you're, you're definitely gonna end up with fibers um, in, your, in your hand. You'll notice it you know, throughout the day if you um, go home and wash your hands at night. But um, another thing to consider here is the one-to-one -one design aspect. So in the bridges that we've installed currently, if there was a rebar alternative, um, the GFRP is, uh, the, the spacing is tighter than, than the steel reinforcing. So for example, if, if the, the rebar was designed at six inch centers, the GFRP alternative would have been five inches or, or four inches centers. Um, so therefore resulting in, in more bar with the GFRP. Um, so, so what we look forward to is, is as a design and everybody becomes more comfortable with it, if we can get to the one-to-one -one, uh, ratio there, that, that we'll start to see a, a, big, a bigger significant um, labor decrease. Uh, I would say at this point, the, the most time consuming when installing reinforcing on a bridge deck application is the actual tying of the bar. And um, that 
as of now, we've been able to use the same tie wire that we've used for the reinforcing steel. Um, it's just a coated um, tie wire, steel wire, that is uh, the same that we would use on the epoxy coated rebar as well. Um, handling the bars and, and rigging, rigging and, and carrying the bars, um, you, you still rig the bars the same. Um, you use same, same rigging practices, um, the same slings and chokers uh, that we use um, in the field. So, so there's not much of a difference there. It, it behaves the same. There is a slight difference in, in the weight of the material as, as you're walking on it. With the GFRP being lighter, it, it tends to want to move a little bit more until you secure it in what we call you know, framing the bars. And, and so once, once the bridge deck's framed up, you won't see the bars moving as much. But when they are standing there loose, they, they do want to roll on you a little bit more than what they would. Um, and from a, from a supplier standpoint, trucking is a big savings. Um, you can get a significant amount of uh, GFRP on the truck. Most steel trucks are restricted by weight, um, usually around 48,000 pounds of bar, and it adds up pretty quick with steel, where the GFRP is light enough that usually it's just a matter of how much you can stack on the truck and, and secure. Um, one of the big changes that we had to adapt here to as we started to bid GFRP is, is the changing between linear feet and pounds. Um, it's been historic um, tracked with um, iron workers that we track per pound how much weight can a rebar guy put in in a day and you know whether that's 250 pounds per man hour or or a ton of person per day or you know or more in bridge decks we've seen upwards of two tons per person per day um, you know and, and that's how we've tracked it so now where GFRP comes out and we had the linear footage and so when we bid our first project, we had to get a little creative and, and I've actually ran all the calculations to convert the equivalent of the number four GFRP backwards into a number four steel bar. And, and I had to, to do that because we were accustomed to the weight versus the linear footage. And um, even our crews in the field, they're used to tracking productions per, uh, per pound. So they would report back to the office, you know, like a seven man crew installed 10 tons today. And now, you know, it, it would be a matter of how many thousands of feet did you install? So, so that's been an adjustment for us as well. And then um, one thing I wanted to touch on was field fabrication um, and just letting everybody know that, you know, it's industry standard in, in Michigan and Ohio. It is very specific that we do not field fabricate reinforcing. Uh, we do not bid it that way. And if we are field fabricating something, it, it typically means that that something went um, whether that's um, a misfab or, or potentially a design error or, or something just not working right, um, we, that would be a, a pure extra for us. With GFRP, um, the, the uh, cordless um, grinder we've got there in, the, in this slide uh, will cut through the GFRP very easily. Um, you can cut it in big bundles, you can cut it with partner saws, chop saws, just like you do steel. Um, it cuts very easy. Um, almost like a knife going through butter, um, but you cannot field bend it. So, so it creates a little bit of, of a situation where, you know, what do you do if, if the bars are bent wrong, if, if GFRP is, is scheduled on your project? Well, you know, there's nothing you really you can do. So it's gonna create a stoppage in work, or, you know, there needs to be something, the, the supplier of GFRP needs to be held accountable for quality control and making sure that that's not an error or mistake on their part but um, for a steel standpoint there's fabricators small fabricators all throughout you know the state of ohio and michigan and and typically within a day or two you can you can find that where in this case uh, you could potentially slow down a project if, if there were mistakes and uh, we've looked at with owens corning and and others of uh, what the possibility of, of possibly having additional steel sent and if you're dealing with just the bridge decks and, and no bends, you know, it's not as, as big of a situation, but it's more um, comes up when, when there are bent bars. Um, another, another thing we've been dealing with is also um, relaying the importance of the fabricated tables in the, in the drawings. Um, as an installer, we use the bar marks and, and the bar charts daily to, to figure out what we're installing. And, what we've experienced with some of the fiberglass is that they're using inches 
um, total inches, so a 20 foot bar, you know, it would not come out labeled as a 20 foot bar, it would come out in inches and, and we had to have our guys, um, you know, use some calculators and do some math and figure out what bars are what. But um, that's one thing we've been trying to streamline specifically with Owens Corning and making sure that the tags on the bundles are, are relating to what is being called out in the drawings. Um, and then just kind of in conclusion here, you know, as a, from an installer standpoint, uh, why not reduce the amount of weight, whether it's the dead load or or the weight that our crews are, are carrying around daily? You know, it, it's so if comparing steel versus fiberglass in a deck application, um, you know, we would prefer for our crews to carry less weight and for you know the, the speed, speeding up of productions. Right now, manpower is, is there's a shortage nationwide, and we're we're hiring from all over the country, and um, the, we're being asked to do more work. There's there's a lot of DOT work that's been released right now, especially for us in the state of Ohio and Michigan, and um, we're being asked to do more with less people. And and I think that this fiberglass is is a way to to help increase that. Um, so I look forward to answering any questions that anybody has later. Uh, for now, I'm going to turn it over to Rich with um, Mannequin Smith. Uh, hello everyone, this is Chris Holman with the Mannequin Smith Group and I'm here with Rich Spino who is our bridge uh, expert in GFRP. And what we're going to talk about today is a, our practitioner perspective. Uh, we began working with Owens Corning and ODOT back in 2017 to potentially introduce GFRP into uh, bridge decks on current projects that we already had uh, in process. So specifically, and uh, these are some of the bridges that David Geckel uh, mentioned at the beginning of this presentation and, and uh, they were also touched on by some others. But the, the first one that we worked on was up in the upper right hand corner there is the Anthony Wayne Trail Bridge in Toledo. It's over the Norfolk Southern uh, Railroad, which like David said, is one of the busiest lines in the country. And that was the first bridge that we did the design of GFRP with. And that particular bridge was under the, the version one of the design specs that uh, uh, Tim Shelton mentioned those design guide specifications earlier in his presentation. The next one was uh, the I-475 bridge. That's the one that had the four individual bridge decks. We actually uh, used the second code or the second version of the design guides on those four structures. And then the most recent one is the Liberty Bridge in Henry County, the point Ohio. And that's like David said, that was the largest one that we did. And that was also done under version two. And what we've got here to present is the actual designs and some cost comparisons. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Rich so he can elaborate on that. Thanks, Chris. Uh, my name is Rich Spino. I'm the senior structural design engineer and uh, team leader for the Ohio and West Virginia uh, bridge departments for the Mannequin Smith Group. And we're going to take a look at these uh, three case studies of actual designs where we did uh, designs with the epoxy coated steel and the GFRP reinforcing uh, so we can have a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. Uh, within the past five years uh, the Mannequin Smith Group has had the opportunity to, uh, opportunity to design six bridge decks in Northwest Ohio uh, using this GFRP reinforcing. Most of our experience in the design of these structures were with the first and second editions of the Ashto GFRP manual and they are currently on the verge of already being outdated. So uh, 
for uh, these side-by-side -side comparisons, we're going to include a lot of the uh, bid cost comparisons as well. The first bridge uh, we're going to talk about is the Anthony Wayne Trail Bridge over Norfolk Southern Railroad uh, leading into downtown Toledo. Uh, this project replaces an existing single span structure with a three span composite continuous steel beam bridge on a 45 degree skew. The structure carries seven lanes of traffic and included a shared use path on one edge and a sidewalk on the other. The bridge was completed in 2020 and the structure was built in two stages in order to keep uh, State Route 25 open and allow for a lap of splices between the stages. Um, as you can see from the proposed transverse section, there is an eight foot median in the center of this bridge and that is where the splice took place. The Anthony Wayne Trail Bridge was originally designed for conventional reinforcement, but went to bid with a GFRP alternative. It was designed according to the first edition of the AASHTO GFRP specs. This slide shows the difference between the steel reinforcing spacing and the GFRP spacing. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the views, the transverse section views with the steel is shown over the piers to show the uh, additional requirement of the GFRP bars in this area. Uh, the shear controlled GFRP design resulted in a 53.6% increase in reinforcing value over conventional steel in the main reinforcing bars. The increase for the longitudinal bars was based on the crack control specification, which was laid out in the first manual. When the second edition came out, Manic and Smith ran calculations for the new specifications to compare the results to the first edition. As you can see, the new edition resulted in an 11% decrease in the sectional area of the primary reinforcing when compared to the first edition. One thing to note when comparing these two items, uh, steel and GFRP, uh, the best way to cost them out uh, is by square foot of transverse sectional deck. This is due to the fact that the steel is quantified by pound and the GFRP is measured by linear foot. The Anthony Wayne cost comparisons were based on contractor bid prices from the bid tabulations. Steel for the structure was determined to cost around $8 per square foot, while the bid based on the first edition of the GFRP manual came to a little over a nine and a half dollars per square foot. Using these same numbers, we were able to determine that the cost of the GFRP under the second edition would reduce the cost per square foot by about 80 cents. Worth noting is that the bid for bid price for steel at the time of this bid was a dollar per pound. The second bridge that Manic and Smith designed for GFRP is uh, the Industrial Drive Bridge located outside of Napoleon, Ohio. Uh, this is also the Liberty Bridge. Uh, it was originally uh, went under the Industrial Drive, so I might mistakenly call it that a couple of times. Uh, this bridge is a complete new crossing over the Maumee River to service the Campbell's facility to reroute semi-trucks away from the city. The proposed structure is an eight-span pre-stressed concrete I-beam bridge on a zero-degree skew. The structure carries two lanes of traffic with a raised sidewalk on one side. The official bridge opening was last month and uh, they do have had traffic on it. Uh, due to it being a new structure, no stage construction was needed. This structure was originally designed with construction conventional steel uh, during stage and was revised to GFRP during stage three using the second edition of the AASHTO GFRP manual. As with the Anthony Wayne Trail Bridge, Shear controlled the primary reinforcing in the design of the Liberty Bridge. The 10 foot beam spacing of this structure required the bar size to be increased from a typical number five bar to a number six bar. 
<laughs> this resulted in a 75.8% increase to sectional area of reinforcing over conventional steel. The additional bars over the piers in the negative moment range was also increased from a five bar to a six bar as well to due to crack control. For the industrial dry or for the Liberty Bridge, the cost of reinforcing steel rose uh, from the bid specs to $1.27 per pound. This increase in steel costs and the new specification in the GFRP manual showed a cost savings of about 50 cents over conventional steel. These numbers came from the project bid tabs, uh, which was opened on December 19th of 2019. The last case study to discuss in the I-475 project over Door Street and Hill. This project is a rehabilitation and widening to accommodate a third lane in both directions along I-475 and consists of dual twin three-span composite continual steel beam superstructures utilizing the same span configurations. The, structure was, the structures were open in time for the Solheim Cup in August of this year. Due to the maintenance of traffic scheme, the stage construction required the use of mechanical connectors. Like the previous two projects, these bridges were originally designed with conventional steel reinforcing and redesigned using the second edition of the GFRP manual. These four bridges have an eight foot, uh, eight foot beam spacing, which was small enough to transfer the controlling design from shear to crack control. These structures also required an extra bar in the overhang, so MSG increased the bar size from fives to sixes to avoid violating the minimum spacing requirement. The final cost comparison is from the I-475 project. The average bid for this steel on this project, the average bridge price for steel on this project rose to $1.50 per pound. Uh, this is also a little odd um, as it came before, this bid was before the Liberty Bridge uh, two months earlier, which was uh, opened in September. The cost of the GFRP bars with the mechanical connectors would have resulted in a savings of almost $6 a square foot, which was a dollar less than our engineering estimate. Uh, however, the original mechanical connector was not ready in time for this uh, time sensitive project uh, as the bridge had to be opened by August of this year. And uh, MMFX connectors with stainless steel bars, dowels were used instead. That bumped the total cost up to about a dollar twenty-five more than conventional reinforcing. The important takeaways uh, from our experience with designing these GFRP decks is just how much beam spacing plays a part in the amount of bars used and ultimately the cost savings. As you've heard earlier today, eight foot beam spacing appears to be the ideal spot to use GFRP reinforcing. And as the cost of steel, the steel reinforcing bars continue to rise into delay today's climate, GFRP has become a viable alternative to save the client money, both now and in future maintenance. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Tim Keller. Tim, you're on mute. Okay, how about now? Perfect. There we go. It wasn't on mute. It was it was green. Um, anyway, uh, first thing I want to do is thank the presenters. Um, thank you very much for staying on time. Uh, thank you very much for your time in, in presenting your perspective of it. Uh, so thank you very much for that. So uh, where are we going? Right, where's ODOT going um, with GFRP? And um, there's a bunch of questions coming in and we'll, we'll hit those as well. There's some really good questions there. And so 
there was a couple of things that that were prevalent in these presentations. One is cost, and we'll we'll, we'll spend a little time with that. But um, rem remember that um, uh, maybe not remember that's the wrong word is um, ODOT's steel prices have increased dramatically in the last year and a half, and so. Uh, when steel prices went up, uh, there was some discussions about whether epoxy was going to be available, um, supply chain issues. And so uh, we, we talked in our office about what plan B was if, if, if we got into a problem, uh, shutting down projects wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, going to be plan B. So, so we, we looked at alternative uh, reinforcements. Uh, GFRP was one of them. So that was uh, impetus to, to, to move quickly with this. Um, to move more quickly anyway with, with this. Um, GFRP has been around for 30 years. Uh, the first bridge deck that ODOT did, uh, I wasn't with ODOT at the time. I've been with ODOT 20 years now, so it was pre-ODOT, pre so it was 20, 25 years ago or so um, in Dayton. And so it's been around for a long time. So, so why, why didn't it catch on 25, 30 years ago? Uh, a couple of issues had to happen. One is the ASHTO specifications had to happen. Um, we had to co codify, codify uh, the use of GFRP uh, that is in place now. Uh, it, it's very similar to ACI 440, uh, very similar. Those two documents uh, are very similar. Obviously, one's uh, geared towards uh, transportation bridges and one's uh, mostly geared towards vertical construction, but, but the material uh, is, is there. And so uh, it's being used on the private sector vertical construction as well. So, so where's ODOT going? Um, we've had some challenges, and that challenges in the last couple of years have have uh, have been brought forward uh, pretty dramatically. Um, epoxy coated reinforcing steel. I, I'm still a big believer if you can get epoxy coated steel in place without damage, is a good product. Uh, unfortunately, getting it uh, placed in service is becoming more and more of a challenge. Um, culturally, we, we have some challenges in front of us. Um, is chipping a, a epoxy off of a bar, is that a big problem or a little problem? And that's a cultural issue. So we're, we're, we're ODOT is taking um, uh, a couple of more swings at that to try and, and uh, improve, uh, change the culture and improve the, the, the uh, performance of, of epoxy coated steel. At the same time, we, we feel that better performing decks uh, are going to require better performing reinforcement. So we're looking at a number of products that we feel are um, a step up in performance uh, over, over black bar for sure, uh, but over damaged epoxy coated steel. So, so we, are, uh, we are moving forward with a number of products. Um, I wouldn't say these are piloted because we've piloted all of the products. Uh, we're moving into, um, and this is more of a, an owner's perspective of, of we need to decide where we should have a better performing uh, deck. Obvious, some obvious examples of that is, is our high value assets, right? Our, our bridges with uh, large bridges, uh, very expensive to replace decks. Um, uh, now, some some of those are in very urban areas where we have huge ADTs and shutting lanes down is problematic for us. So we're in the process of putting together uh, some guidance uh, for our districts to to use in in determining uh, what reinforcement to use where. If GFRP, if GFRP was a uh, direct replacement from, from epoxy coated, it'd be easy, but it's not. Uh, it, we, we, we don't want to do a direct, uh, you can, but we don't want to do a direct uh, replacement. We want to be able to use the, the ability to, um, um, of the um, lap lengths, the smaller lap lengths, we want to be able to use the additional uh, strength in those bars. So, so we've been working with Owens Corning, and I want to thank Owens Corning. Um, we've been working with them uh, for a while, um, and I and I challenged them with a number of areas. Uh, I challenged them with cost for one, and you, you saw that the cost is 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 uh, competitive, extremely competitive. Um, uh, steel prices going up, cost is is being competitive. So there was a number of questions uh, in there, and I'll I'll, I'll Ask Dave uh, Geckel to answer a couple more questions on, on cost. So, so that was a, a challenge I, I, I gave Owens Gordon, and and right now we, we seem to be competitive. Two was to um, uh, the um, 
mechanical connect connectors. Uh, we don't, we, we, we actually, actually have, as of today, we still don't have an approved mechanical connector, but uh, Owens Corning worked on uh, a mechanical connector that um, we could be used uh, uh, with GFRP. Uh, we're in the process of reviewing it. Uh, we're going to, we're going to review that uh, over the next uh, few months. Um, so, so they stepped up and, and invested into some research and some and some uh, work to to determine that, and I want to thank them for that. And and the third piece of this was was can we can we do a uh, hydro demolition on a on a on a deck with GFRP? And and we talked about that some, and the answer is yes, with with caution, with great deal of caution. So so the the hurdles that were in place um, 25 years ago, 30 years ago are are gone. Uh, I think they're gone. Um, there is this is this material needs to be used differently or used to um, uh, you, you heard from from contractors and designers and 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 uh, uh, the guys actually handling the bars. There is some differences. Uh, there are some differences, not not monumental differences, and that's why you pilot projects, right? That's why when you bring a new material in, you you need to do some projects to see where where the challenges are, where where the adjustments need to be made, and and we've done that. So where are we going? Well, you're, you're going to, in the future, you're going to see uh, some of your designs. For those of you that are designers, uh, you're going to see some of those that uh, we're going to ask you to do in GFRP. Um, uh, as in addition to some, maybe some of the other products. Mm -hmm. And and where we're trying to decide as, a, as an owner is, is where's the sweet spot? Where's the sweet spot for use of this material? And, and, and can it be used everywhere? Um, one of the challenges that that we're still I'm still dealing with and 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 wrestling with is the bent bars. Um, you cannot bend them in the field, at least not now. There's some discussions about w whether there'll be a, a system uh, being able to bend them in this field, but right now the answer is no. So if you break a bar, right, th these bars are extraordinarily um, brittle. Uh, they're not ductile. Um, if you break a bar in the field, what happens? And, and you don't want to shut a project down, shut a, a, a deck pour or a deck uh, down to uh, because you broke a bar, right? And so, how, how do we how do we manage that? Do we do we add additional bent bars? Do we and 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 that's something that we as an owner have to have to have to determine is how do we want to manage uh, this this material? Uh, because with a with a epoxy coated bars, you, you know it's a it's a commodity that's readily available. Uh, you go you go um, take one of the bars, the extra bars that you you ordered, and you bend it and and you move on, and and it's not a big deal if you damage a bar. So so those are some of the things that um, that that I thought through as we were going through this. Oh, one more. Uh, where where are we going to use GFRP? Um, there was a couple of questions. Uh, should we use them in other locations? Right now, um, we're going to focus on decks. Uh, I'm because the in 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 um, GFRP terms and uh, the specifications, they, they they use the term knockdown factors, right? And, and it's a reduction because they're not ductile. Um, and and so I, I'm still not in favor of using uh, GFRP in uh, longitudinal uh, beams. Um, in in pier caps, I, I'm just not sure that we should be going there yet. Uh, I'm not ready to go there yet. I, I like sleeping at night. Uh, so so right now the the big quantity of reinforcement steel in in a deck job or in a bridge job, excuse me, is in the deck. So so um, ductility in the deck is not as critical. Um, and so that's where we're starting. Uh, um, as we as as more and more contractors get comfortable with it um as more and more um designers get comfortable with it um that may change but right now uh, for the near future i don't i don't see any reason to move into um beams into pier caps um so uh that's kind of where we are as a owner um I, I appreciate uh, the questions. Why don't we hit some of these questions? Uh, the first one, Dave Gecko, I'm going to throw at you. Um, there was a question about uh, how you, what the cost was in in Toledo. Uh, did the pricing come down? And I know we we, we did some things up there that uh, uh, that we we didn't really go over. Uh, and I thought maybe uh, with with some time here, you can you can explain what we did up there with with uh, with bidding. 
Yeah, so <clears throat> I think uh, Manic and Smith and Rich uh, and Chris both kind of touched on a little bit, but um, the first job that we did, uh, we, we bid it as an alternative bid. So we, we designed a job with uh, epoxy coated rebar. We bid it with uh, GFRP as the alternate. Um, I think the bids came in, I don't remember the exact dollar amount, but we paid probably an additional $40,000, uh, something around there for GFRP. Uh, again, it was it was a uh, pretty high profile bridge for us uh, over Norfolk Southern and we had a terrible time getting track time uh, in order to do the replacement that we did. So we, we you know, extended the life by even if it's 5, 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, we thought we could get a better return on our, on our our dollar for that, so we ended up accepting the alternative bid. And we paid a little bit extra for the GFRP. Um, we took that experience when we went and bid the uh, the four uh, mainline interstate 475 projects uh, exclusively GFRP. There was no uh, there was no epoxy code reinforcing in the bid. Um, when we figured out the deck area by the dollars for the reinforcement. Um, Actually, the GFRP came in very competitive with with the uh, epoxy coated resteel. Um, it was it was pretty much a one for one swap dollar wise for for reinforcement in the deck. Um, so again, we we kind of took that. We went out to the uh, Henry County Liberty Bridge, and I I don't even remember exactly what we did for bidding on that one. I think uh, GFRP may have been an alternate, uh, but we ended up selecting it, and the cost difference on that job was very minimal. Um, but we, we've sold a couple of bridge redecking projects here recently in the last month or so. And um, our, our uh, epoxy coated resteel price um, that we're getting is around $1.35, $1.50 a pound. So it has gone up considerably since we bid those jobs uh, for a dollar a pound. So uh, I feel that GFRP would be uh, very competitive uh, and most likely cheaper right now than uh, epoxy coated resteel. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate that. Um, and like I said, that's always the question when you bring a new material in, cost, cost, cost. Um, Dave Hartman, I'm going to throw one at you. Uh, the question was um, about profile. Is the profile in uh, GFRP bars uh, more or less than the profile uh, of, a, uh, of a steel bar? So I'm going to throw that one at you. So, Tim, the uh, profile, are we talking about the uh, form factor or the surface yes. of the bar? Okay. That, that was my understanding of the question. The helical machining that we currently use on the surface of a uh, smooth rebar uh, has been uh, tested for the uh, bond characteristics, and uh, it meets the requirements of ACI and, and Ashto. I think the uh, the significant uh, difference is it's not sand coated, and uh, this new rebar being more consistent is uh, has met now three sets of uh, test for the bond characterization and done quite well in concretes with uh, different aggregates, different uh, strengths, and uh, if there are any questions on the specific details. Uh, the picture that I shared uh, shows that the uh, pitch is important as well as the uh, nature of the uh, the lug or the uh, crown of the uh, machined area. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Um, going through these, um, question about uh, clearance of bars. Um, I answered it pretty long term in the chat box. I'm hoping you guys can see that. Um, the first uh, project we did, um, again, a date in 25 years ago, um, the thought was that you could cut down the uh, cover over top of the bar. It was, I believe it was an inch and a half, um, not too long after the, the, the bridge was in service. Uh, I took the opportunity to go take a look at it. You could, you could see where every longitudinal bar was. There was a crack above it. My thought and again, this is my my thought and only my thought. We didn't do any tests on this. Was that the uh, the the coefficient, uh, thermal coefficient of uh, GFRP is different than concrete or steel? They're very very similar, and so that difference is going to create some uh, as it as it uh, heats up and cools down. It's going to create some um, some stress differential at the interface, and and I think 
that the reason we saw those cracks was because of the thermal differential. Um, and so uh, using, uh, so since we've used two and a half inches, we haven't seen that. Um, so I believe that uh, that two and a half inches matters uh, to keep the, the cracking down. So uh, that's my thought anyway. Um, oh, that one we answered, Dave hit that one. Uh, a lot of these questions were in early and, um, Oh, uh, Dave Hartman, I'll hit you with this one again. The question was um, carbon footprint, um, GFRP versus steel. Do you have any idea whether you're more or less or the same as 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 uh, as steel as steel rebar? This is uh, this is a question, Tim, that we uh, that we get quite often. We're currently working uh, through LCA and EPD. Uh, in our new facility, uh, Concord, and you you need uh, a year's uh, production in order to uh, to actually have a, a full LCA for the requirements in the EPD. Uh, but as we uh, look at um, the uh, nature of the rebar in the in the past and the LCAs that have been completed, uh, we we find that the the carbon uh, footprint. Uh, is less than the steel, but the recycled content of the steel and the uh, logistics of the steel uh, can favor certain perspectives of the steel. And so I, I think it'll be close on the uh, on the installed uh, cost. If you look at uh, the uh, life cycle uh, and uh, you understand uh, whether or not you have 10 years of improvement before you need an overlay or or 20 years, whatever that might be. As you look at the full service life, uh, certainly uh, we're reducing the uh, usage of uh, concrete and uh, all of the uh, materials required to build uh, new decks, for example. Uh, so we we see uh, the life the full life cycle analysis as we and as we look at life cycle cost uh, being much improved. Okay, stay with me. I've got another one here. Uh, does the GFR GFRP bar utilize recycled material? It does not today. Um, usually uh, what we find is that the uh, life that we have on the fiberglass rebar has not required um, end of life uh, recycling. What, what we envision and what we have looked at is uh, just grinding the uh, rebar in with the uh, concrete at end of life uh, as part of the uh, aggregate feed or it can be backfill on the job site. Um, today, when we manufacture the rebar, there is, is very little waste. Um, we do have uh, from the grinding operation uh, where we collect just a few bags on a regular basis that we're looking at, uh, can we uh, achieve circularity by putting that back into our process? Okay, stay with me. Um, this one is kind of an interesting question. I'm not sure who all to answer, so I'm going to start with you. Uh, and that is um, using um, fibers in the concrete. Is that a good idea to use with GFRP? Bad idea? We don't know yet. What, what, what do you think, Dave? Well, as you know, it depends on the uh, concrete and the application and uh, what uh, we're seeing is that there is a um, interest, uh, for example, in uh, critical joints, you know, for looking at uh, fiber uh, in those uh, joints. And uh, we do have a business there. Uh, also, we have been asked, you know, could we combine the uh, reinforced, reinforcing with uh, uh, fiber? You know, and so, you know, kind of all the above uh, is, um, is uh, in, in practice. Yeah, I know. Um... Some of the uh, the Canadian spec allows uh, fiber as the primary reinforcement. Um, I'm not quite there. Uh, uh, I guess my 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 question was more: is there is there any reason not to use GFRP with uh, with fibers uh, in the concrete? Uh, GFRP bars and fiber uh, in the concrete. Is there any any um, reason not to do that? 
None that I can think of. Uh, probably uh, the question would come down to cost. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Uh, next question is, uh, what about using GFRP in footings and walls? Um, um, right now, ODOT is not focused in those areas. Uh, if if a owner uh, so chooses, I wouldn't see any issues there um, with using it in, in footings um, or, or walls, uh, assuming that uh, the wall is not structural carrying uh, carrying um, uh, a vertical load, I'm not sure I would do that. Uh, but right now, we're ODOT's not headed that direction. Um, so just just to help on that, when we look at um, coastal areas um, where the footings are are submerged in uh, seawater, there's more of an issue with the uh, steel, and uh, the real state of the steel becomes an issue. So we, we do have um, interest in, uh, and we have um, placed the uh, fiberglass rebar in uh, footings, uh, also other substructures. Uh, abutment walls is a big area that we see in, in FDOT. And of course, I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the sea walls are of interest. Um, I guess what we'd like to see in, in Ohio is, as you mentioned, uh, build on the uh, bridge deck to look at uh, approach slabs, uh, continue to, uh, to do the work uh, that Sean mentioned in the traffic barriers. Uh, but certainly, uh, we'd be interested uh, when it's appropriate to look at uh, columns and some other structures that, uh, that we've seen some benefits uh, with the uh, fiberglass rebar in other states. Thank you. Uh, Sean Metals, I'm going to throw this one at you. Uh, mechanical connectors, are they currently available? Um, wh where do we stand with mechanical couplers? Um, yeah, and Dave can help answer this as well. Um, they, Owens Corning has developed a crimped mechanical connector onto a GFRP reinforced bar that shows very good uh, it, so far, they've had very good results with that. Um, I, I think the idea there is that the crimping would be done uh, prior to delivery to the site, so that we wouldn't be crimping in the site. Um, you know, so so that's kind of the the, the mechanical connector we're looking for. Um, it, it, as uh, Dave Gecko mentioned earlier, we've uh, we've used mechanical connectors with GFRP reinforcement. Those connectors were um, MMFX connectors with stainless steel rebar that was lap splice with the uh, uh, with the GFRP reinforcement. So uh, that's kind of the mechanical connectors we've used to date. Dave, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I would just add quickly. We've had interest by uh, several. Uh, suppliers um, of me mechanical connectors, and uh, I think uh, they're just waiting uh, to bring that forward as we uh, uh, look more and more at phase construction uh, in the bridge decks. I would agree with Sean that uh, we're finishing the um, specification of the uh, rebar uh, connectors that we've we've worked on. Uh, we, we have seen uh, consistent performance in the, uh, the past with, with these uh, swaged or crimp, crimped uh, structures. And um, it also is a good way to, uh, to actually test the, uh, the strength of the rebar using these connectors, which is uh, proof that we get full strength in the bar that the uh, connectors are working. Uh, one of the questions that uh, Sean and I have is uh, how best uh, to do this uh, so it's robust in the field, uh, but also easy to specify and uh, allow multiple suppliers. Thank you. Uh, Brad Carpenter, I'm going to throw this one at you. Um, you mentioned using same tie wire as used in reinforced deck. Any changes to the amount of tying? Uh, no changes in the amount. Uh, in Ohio, it's 50% uh, top and bottom, and, and we, we stuck with that. All right, stay with me here. Uh, 
Do you wear a mask when cutting GFRP bars? Um, we have not. Uh, we, we wear a face shield and, and safety glasses uh, and then the long sleeves and the gloves, um, but uh, they are not wearing masks. Okay. Um, let's throw this one at Rich. Uh, Rich, the question is, if the bridge is designed with GFRP bars, can the steel beam spacing be increased? Uh, the larger the uh, bar beam spacing, the tighter this the bar spacing. So um, it's it's probably better to go the other way than um, increasing the beam spacing. Um, with the the larger the beam spacing, you introduce punching shear from the wheel loads, which uh, is typically what we run into with the controlling feature. So the more wheel loads per bay, the tighter the spacing is going to be. Thanks, Rich. Um, next question I think I'll take. Uh, will we be able to use GFRP for the par parapet vertical bars in the future? We're looking at that. Um, we would like to be able to do that. We would uh, like confidence that um, uh, we, we don't, um, delay a project because of that, because of broken bars or because of, uh, of an issue with a bar. So we're working through that, um, whether that means um, ordering extra extra bars for the parapet or whether that means potentially if, if a bar is damaged, do we, do we uh, replace it with a, a more conventional bar? So we're looking at that. Um, we're, 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 we're hoping to get to an answer yes there, we're just not there today. Okay, I'm gonna skip that one. Uh, have you considered using GFRP and composite box beams and making it standard? Uh, not yet. Um, right now we're focused on um, decks. That's not saying we won't uh, we won't continue branching out with uh, with other reinforcements with GFRP. Um, okay, good. There's a there's a good question. I should have I should have started with this. Um, thank you for the nice presentation. Would you please share the slides, uh, Paula? You have uh, all the presentations now, I believe, and you'll send those out. I'm going to say Paula said yes to that. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Um, what are your concerns with using GFRP in, in girders or caps? It's it's uh, the loss of ductility. Um, we we um, the ductility is 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 something I I I don't give up grudgingly. Um, steel has much ductility. Our Pre-stress box beams have much ductility. We've done some testing on that. Um, the, the the thought out there is that um, you understand what's using your bridges, and the fact of the matter is we don't. Um, what's using our bridges today? Um, we we have legal limits, uh, but what's reality? Reality is very different than that. And so having ductile uh, designs uh, to me is is important as an owner. Uh, I want to know. Uh, when something large has damaged our, our, our bridge um, and our beams. So, so to me, um, giving up ductility in, in longitudinal members, um, I, I'm going to be very cautious about moving in that direction. Um, as long as we have the ability to, to have ductile beams and ductile uh, columns and ductile caps, uh, I, I think that's a, a benefit uh, for an owner. So that's that's the reason. Well, that's a good question. I think I'll throw this at Sean, just because, you know, I can. Uh, can a hybrid approach be used in a deck reinforcing design, i.e. using GFRP for straight bars and epoxy bars for bent bars? Uh, most of the bent bars are minimal in a bridge compared to straight bars. Yeah, certainly from a design perspective, there's no issue with doing that. Um, 
you know, cost wise, I think costs has shown that they're very competitive. So I don't know that we're giving up much on cost either. Um, I guess, you know, is it, um, it, it would be up to the owner if that's, if that's a direction they want to take. Uh, I guess the benefit I see right off is that the, you know, the, the consistency with the bent bars and not worrying about if, 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 you're missing some or if something happens or you can bend them out of the way you know we heard that earlier too and that's certainly a benefit with the uh, the epoxy coated steel bars um but yeah i i, I think uh, you know utilizing both is is certainly a viable alternative okay all right it's uh 12 o'clock i'm going to answer one more question uh, just because you know you got to have a last one um has there been any testing of GFRP reinforced concrete in high heat, uh, such as from fires due to vehicle accidents or fuel spills? Um, not that I'm aware of. Um, however, um, any bridge that gets high heat, um, and, and I know that for a fact because I've been involved with five of them, um, is going to damage your bridge, whether it's GFRP, whether it's uh, whether it's uh, uh, epoxy coated reinforcing steel, uh, and, and it really gets down to how hot the how hot the flames, how hot this the the, the bridge got. Uh, again, follow the heat, uh, look up, uh, and and you'll see damage. Um, um, Brent Spence was a, a very good example of that. For those of you who don't know, Brent Spence, uh, there was a nasty fire on that uh, uh, earlier uh, earlier this year. So, uh, heat is a problem no matter what you use. Um, fuel spills and so forth. So um, I, I, it's not a reason not to use GFRP. Um, uh, it, there are um, um, requirements for um, in the design process and in the material specifications for uh, the um, um, shoot, I'm missing the terminology, the, the, the temperature of the bar that, that basically melts the epoxy. Um, and that's part of the specifications. Okay, so uh, it's 12.01. Uh, at least in Columbus, the noon uh, sirens are going off. Uh, so I want to thank the presenters. Uh, you did a great job. I really appreciate this. Uh, Paula is going to send out um, the presentations. I think we have them all. Um, they will be also um, posted uh, somewhere on our, our website. Um, I think we could post them on uh, on uh, uh, the structures website. We'll work through that uh, detail something I just thought about. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to end the meeting, uh, end the webinar. Uh, thank you very much for, for spending a couple hours with us today. Uh, I hope you, uh, learned something that you didn't know, uh, this morning at 10 o'clock. That's, that's my goal for, for any presentation we give that, uh, uh, you learn something that you didn't know, uh, prior to the start. So, uh, if, if that was not the case, I apologize. Uh, I hope we did not waste your two hours of time. Uh, the presenters, thank you very much. And with that, I'm going to end the end the end the webinar. So thank you.